start straight away? Yeah. Sure. Great. Uh, cool. Well, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Don Weldon. Uh, I'm here from uh, Decision Lab, um, and I'm going to talk on uh, Dash, um, giving interactive data visualization web applications without JavaScript. <coughs> Um, so an alternative title for this talk um, would be what you can, can't, should, and probably shouldn't do with Plotly Dash. Um, and so today I'm going to cover a bit about uh, why you might want to use Dash, crucially, and give a basic introduction to it, how it works, and the kind of things that you can actually do with Dash. Uh, and then I want to kind of discuss what we've learned from using Dash across various different teams at Decision Lab. Um, and then at the end, please do over the beers and through the fire alarm, come and approach me and um, we'll get out of the building, evacuate and carry on talking about Dash somehow. Um, <coughs> so I want to give a very brief disclaimer though before I carry on. Um, so I'm not really a Dash uh, expert or I'm not an author on this project um, yet. I've got a couple of pull requests that I want to do at some point, but um, you know, I'm not a, a, a key contributor or anything. This talk really is about using Dash at work. It's not um, an advert for Dash as a framework or Dash as a, a tool by Plotly. Um, and I do want to apologize as well if anyone from Plotly ends up seeing this and saying, no, that's terrible, that's wrong, that's not fair, um, then please get in touch and maybe I'll reply to your email. Maybe not, so. <laughs> okay, um, <clears throat> so if I'm not a, a Dash expert and you know, I'm not uh, an author or so on, why, why am I here? Um, you know, why have I come to, to Prague to talk about Dash? Um, and more to the point as well, I'm a full stack developer. I'm not just a, um, a Python developer. I'm, I work in uh, Python, various databases, Ruby, uh, Rust, um, JavaScript, like uh, CSS. I'm, I'm a full stack developer. Uh, so it's a bit weird, really, to be using Python to be writing JavaScript. And so why am I doing that? And well, the answer is that, as I say, I work for Decision Lab. Um, we're a mathematical modeling consultancy uh, based in central London. Uh, I'm actually on that point as well. I don't know if you're following all the latest debacle and uh, excrement storm that's going on in my country at the moment, but I really am very sorry about that. Um, and I have no idea what's going on there either. And actually, having been traveling through Europe for the last uh, month or so, it's, it's kind of sad to, um, to think that I'm going back there on Friday. Um, still, <laughs> I think that um, what we have across Europe, actually, with the, kind of the Python community, PyDatas, and open source software generally is really very special. Uh, and I really want to do kind of um, you know, celebrate everyone that comes to events like this, um, wherever you come from or wherever you go to, it's, it really is quite special, the community that we have. Um, <clears throat> so moving on, Decision Lab. Um, we have expertise across various different domains, uh, machine learning, optimization, simulation, um, some of the main things that we do. Uh, we work in defense, uh, intelligence, engineering, uh, various other kind of public bodies. We've worked for um, the Food Standards Agency to predict how good a restaurant will be on a machine learning model. We do some uh, weird and wacky projects, and that's because we like interesting and unusual problems more than anything else, rather than uh, doing the same thing over and over again. Um, but crucially, we don't just write reports like a standard um, consultancy. We build tools that clients can use on their data, um, and that might be a very simple proof of concept tool for just one, um, you know, one small project. But then our aim is always that that will lead to something bigger and something, you know, a phase two, phase three, phase four, and we start to build up bigger, bigger products. Um, so as an example of some other, um, you know, uh, restaurants aside, example of some other projects we've done, uh, we've recently done a project using um, machine learning to detect illegal gold mining in Colombia and built a tool that was used by the Colombian government to um, go and see whether or not deforestation is related to illegal gold mining or if it's for some other reason. Uh, and we're currently working to deploy um, a machine learning or neural network based predictive maintenance model aboard a Type 45 destroyer for the Royal Navy. So uh, we're not deploying to AWS, we're not deploying to Azure, we're deploying to the big bloody ship there, um, <coughs> which really does complicate it sometimes. Um, but these are kind of the examples of some of the recent projects we've done. And we'll come back to the gold mining project um, briefly a little bit later on. Um, but this is actually something that I was talking about um, over a beer in the break as well, actually. One thing that we've noticed at Decision Lab, or that I certainly notice when I kind of reflect on my, um, you know, the, the culture of um, programming in the company, is that there are really sort of two cultures of Python here. Um, unless you haven't guessed already, I really quite like emoji. So I've, I've represented them here with uh, the sort of the 
um, uh, the builder sort of emoji and the, um, uh, the scientist emoji. So you've kind of got these data scientists and software engineers. Uh, and if you're familiar with um, uh, some work in the humanities by C.P. Snow, there's this very famous essay in the 1950s um, where he said to discuss the, um, the two cultures of academia. Uh, and this idea that you, on the one hand you've got the arts and then on the other hand you've got the sciences and there's this kind of gulf of mutual co incomprehension between the two. Uh, now I'm not saying it's that bad, <laughs> I don't think it's, it's that bad at all, but there is definitely, um, you know, you can classify uh, people into potentially into two uh, broad groups as either maybe a software engineer, maybe you're more concerned about the web, Django, Flask, SQL Alchemy, that kind of thing. Um, or perhaps you're a data scientist um, where you're more thinking about, oh, this neural network, uh, you know, this machine learning model, um, you know, pandas, that, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> and, and in fact, it's reflected in our communities as well. We have, you know, PyCons and PyDatas, and whilst those things, two things come together and collaboration is key, in the workplace, when you're working on a, on a deadline, on a project, Often that kind of collaboration can be quite costly if you're having to sort of have teams mixed together to produce basic proof of concept things. Um, and so in my role, uh, um, I'm in charge of our um, production team. So I, I take things from uh, clever data scientists and turn them into stable products. Um, you know, I really want to minimize the new technologies that a data scientist or a consultant has to learn in order to be able to start doing something really quickly and making something useful or impressive for a client. Um, <clears throat> and so I really want the, the data scientist here to take the lead on maybe prototyping, say like a proof of concept dashboard or something for a, a client that they can do very, very quickly, that's not going to go into full scale production with thousands and thousands of users, but is going to be something that maybe in a week or two's time, we can come back to a client and say, hey, we've got this thing for you. How do you want to using it? And so that's how we, we came across Dash. Um, and I'm really not making this up actually, um, <laughs> it seemed too good to be true to not include it, but um, about an hour ago, I got a message on our company Slack from one of my, uh, a colleague of mine who's joined very, very recently, uh, and she was saying that, oh, she wants to build a really simple tool that some of our um, engineering clients can uh, use to produce a curve in response to a couple of numbers. Uh, they used to do it in Excel, but it didn't really work properly, it didn't look very good. We've done something similar at university uh, with R Shiny, but we're not really sure how to do that, and no one really in the company uses R anymore. What could we do with, uh, um, you know, what could we use to do this? Um, and so I introduced her to our kind of company um, docs on Dash. Uh, so that, that really was like about 45 minutes or an hour ago that I got this message, so it's been very, very apt. Um, so Dash is an open source project. Uh, there are some paid consultancy options as well. Uh, and I think in June this year, it hit version one. So it's quite a young project, but it's been around for a little while. Um, but, you know, it does, it does change quite rapidly. And it's kind of tagline or it's sort of unique selling point is that you can build interactive websites without using JavaScript. And some of you might think that's a good thing. <laughs> Who think that's a good thing? <laughs> Pi data, <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> um, whereas, uh, obviously, if you're maybe a software engineer, you think, oh gosh, what's, what's gonna happen here? Um, <clears throat> but, so for the rest of this talk, I want to give sort of a brief overview of how Dash works. Uh, I want to kind of give some examples of the sort of things that you can do with Dash very quickly. Uh, discuss some potential kind of good practices, so to speak, on, on Dash as you start to build larger applications. Uh, and then give a brief opinion on sort of when to stop using Dash and to start building a more involved or proper web application. Um, there are several code examples in this talk, um, and I'll put this link up several times in these slides, um, but if you go to that link there on my GitHub, um, you can get all of these code examples, and there's a handy little Docker Compose as well that you can just run, and then the links in the readme of that, that GitHub repository will start to magically work if you run it on your laptop. Um, okay, so uh, first things first, install Dash, obviously, using pip. Um, let's build a Hello World application. Uh, so here we've got the, the code example, and sorry, I, I can't really maneuver to, uh, to do this, but uh, you can see we're doing a couple of things here. First things first, we import two um, Dash libraries, that, uh, or Dash uh, packages, sorry, um, that I'll come to in a minute or two. Uh, we create our app here, just like you might create a Flask application or something, and actually, under the hood, um, Dash is building a Flask application for you when you do that. 
And we define this layout here, and here we're just doing a very simple one. We've got a division tag um, with a heading tag in the middle of it. Um, and then you can see at the end, we just run our application. And so, uh, unfortunately, there's no real slick way to do this with Google Slides. So if you give me a moment, uh, you can see here, <coughs> um, this is running on my laptop now using that, that Docker image. And so now I've just created uh, a very brief Hello World website using nothing but Python, and it's running on my laptop locally. Uh, you can see here I've cheated as well because I've put a little Decision Lab logo up at the top here, but that's just using a style sheet um, that, that Dash will look for automatically. So there's nothing, nothing special about that. Okay, and then if we move back. Um, <coughs> so if we look at what, what's going on here, um, those two packages that we imported um, are, are important. The first one was something called Dash HTML components. And these are just uh, uh, wrappers, so um, around React components. So uh, they, it creates bits of the web page, or bits of the kind of the HTML layout in the page called Dash components. They wrap React components, and React components just wrap HTML tags. So it's basically a way of defining an HTML tag layout um, using nothing but Python. And then the second library here, Dash, um, that manages the relationships between these components. Um, and it also serves the application um, using Flask. Uh, so moving on, um, the, as I said, the title of this talk is all about building an interactive web page. And so far, all we've done is display Hello Prague with an emoji. And that's not going to impress your clients as much as perhaps an interactive emoji-based website would do. So <coughs> um, I'm going to suggest that ne the next thing we do is build a sort of Hello Anyone kind of application. Uh, using these beautiful f strings here. Uh, is everyone, does everyone use these, or are people still using like percent? Who's using percent symbol? Yes. <laughs> hate percent symbols. I really do. Okay, great. Yeah, good audience. <laughs> um, okay, so we're going to build a, an application that's basically just going to say hello anyone. But before we start doing that in Dash, let's think about how that would work in JavaScript. Um, and so first things first, we're going to have to um, define our HTML layout. And here we've got three DOM nodes. Uh, and when I say DOM nodes as well, I'm not being vain here because my name's Dom. Uh, I, they are the document object model. Um, I did actually look up whether or not, because uh, my name means uh, often in uh, European languages like Russian, for example, it means uh, house. Um, so I wondered if that was the if that was the case in Czech, but apparently it's like doom or something in the middle, <laughs> middle of the character in the middle. In Dutch, it means stupid. So you know, I'm still doing better than ordinarily. Um, <coughs> okay, so I've got these three three DOM nodes here um, that we're uh, we're defining. Uh, one of them is a paragraph node that you can see here, and inside that paragraph node, uh, we've got this span, uh, and we're giving that span an ID, which is denoted with that that hashtag there. Uh, and we've got this input as well, which is a, a child, uh, sorry, which is a sibling of the, um, the paragraph node, and that's got an ID as well. So we now need to write a JavaScript program that's going to take the value from inside of our input here, this input node, uh, and put it or set it as the value inside of that span node. But the thing that it crucially also has to do is carry on monitoring that for any changes. Because if it happens just once, um, you know, say in response to a single uh, key press, it's not going to happen uh, for all the subsequent key presses. Because this is a website, things can change. It's it's stateful. Um, you know, it's not just something that happens once. And so, in ordinary front-end web development, uh, we would use JavaScript to manipulate our DOM. Um, I'm very manipulable, apparently. Um, but uh, JavaScript essentially has access to the document object model and can change the web the web page. And then we use React as a declarative system to be able to say, rather than having to write a, a complex web application just to constantly you know, monitor this input tag and then see if we need to change anything, we just declare in React how we want our web page to behave, and then React sorts the rest of it out for us. Um, so the precise syntax here isn't important. This is JavaScript. Um, don't boo me. Uh, but here, we, you know, some, our, our final application is going to look something a bit like this. This is a JavaScript function, and it's going to live inside of our browser, and it's just going to take the um, value from our input, and it's going to return it inside of this, this span tag. So this is React code, or JSX, up here. Ooh. There we go. Uh, <coughs> meanwhile, however, uh, so yeah, so in React, our JavaScript function, which lives in the browser, defines the behavior that we, we want to uh, implement. Meanwhile, though, in Dash, 
it, things are a little bit more complex. Um, so interactions are handled by these callbacks, which are functions that are on the server that are called whenever their inputs change. And so if we give an example here, uh, you can see how I've specified this, this layout. Um, you know, we've got uh, the, this division tag like we had before. Uh, and I've put this heading tag up here with um, an input as well. So this is going to take, take some text from our user. Um, uh, and then I've specified this function below that here, which is a callback. Uh, and we're telling Dash that basically, uh, whenever this value here, so the value inside of our input changes um, in using this decorator, I want you to run this function, which is just going to interpolate that string and say hello, whoever. And then I want you to specify it as the value inside of this heading. So we're just saying, whenever this input changes, run my function and then set it as the output inside of this span here. Um, and so to give you an example of what that would look like, uh, no emoji this time on this one, I'm afraid. Um, but so here we have this uh, Hello Prague. You can see um, this is running on my, my laptop now. I've just refreshed. Uh, and so I could do Hello Prague, and I could do Hello Pi Data. Uh, and you can see now we've got a fully interactive web page here um, that's going to change as we, you know, we could write anything in here. We could put whatever we want. Um, and we haven't had to write a single line of JavaScript so far. And uh, you know, this is a very basic example. Um, but with that very basic example, you can start to slot things together um, to really make much more complicated web applications um, with your data and your, your sort of clients. The only issue is, though, that these callbacks now are Python functions. And Python lives on, and they're called whenever the um, inputs change, but Python sort of lives on the server. And so that means that every change now on our website requires some call to go from our client to our server um, and then come back again to say how that web page should be changed. Now, it's fine when it's on my laptop running on Docker locally because if I had network issues with inside my own laptop Docker, then I think something would be very, very wrong. But if it's happening, say, on the internet, that can get a bit slower and it can cause some performance loss. However, that performance loss isn't really a big deal. Um, you know, it might be slightly laggier than your average web page. It's not going to be as slick as Airbnb or Facebook or something like that. Um, but, you know, the, the aim of a Dash website really is to allow my data scientists to build an app really, really quickly using technologies that they're familiar with broadly um, to make something that will go into proof of concept or possibly like a very early alpha. It's not to produce sort of a full, you know, it's not to rival Amazon or something like that. It's just to create a little, you know, data driven application. Um, <clears throat> so if we take it a bit further and ask what can you do with Dash as a whole, um, you know, as the name implies, it's really very much focused towards building dashboards. But that being said, you can also add quite a lot of um, uh, you know, interactive or um, what I call transactional functionality quite easily as well, um, which we'll show in a moment or so. Um, so some of the other examples on here, uh, as you say, they're all in this, this GitHub repository. Um, but the three examples I'm going to show now are listing a data set. Um, and so in this instance, uh, has everyone come across the Titanic data set? Yeah? Nice, simple data set to start out with. Um, yeah, so uh, just a list of passengers that we're going to display. Uh, we're going to build a graph based on that, that Titanic data set. Um, and then I'm going to show you, finally, a classic um, to-do application, which is always like a you know, web development tu uh, a tutorial starter application, and that you can do very simply in Dash as well. So uh, very speedily, we'll go through these now. Uh, so displaying the Titanic passengers um, here, we've got a component for that in Dash. Um, so here you can see there's this Dash data table, uh, which you can use. Uh, so here I've just given it a particular ID of my table. Uh, I've specified the columns as being the columns that are in my data frame currently. Um, but you can see I've actually left the data here blank. And that's because I'm going to specify the data according to the value of this drop-down box here, which I've created. Um, and so the drop-down box is going to allow a user to filter the passengers based on their sex. So I can either show all of the passengers, just the men, or just the women. And so the way that I, I facilitate doing that is by having this callback function. And so you can see, again, here I've specified inside of this decorator, basically, whenever my drop-down value changes, um, I want you to run this function and change the output. And I've just got a really dead simple filter operation there on this pandas data frame. And so without further ado, if we show an example of that working, 
Uh, so here you can see, I'll just refresh so you can get the full experience. Uh, <laughs> And so here you can see uh, this Titanic data set being displayed. Um, here I've got all of the passengers being displayed at the moment uh, in a quite a, you know, visually decent sort of table. This is something that you could use for um, lots of different client use cases. And I say, oh, now I want to show just the, uh, well, there are only two, two genders in this model, but you know, just, just the women. Uh, and then if I said, now I wanted to show just the men, you can see it alters that again. And then I'll go back to all there. And so you can see now that, again, just in a really simple few lines of Python, we've created a fully interactive sort of uh, you know, way of displaying the contents of a data frame. And you know, if you were to link that together, say, with uh, an input or a slider or some other kind of um, you know, control in Dash, and there are plenty inside of the standard Dash library, it's not hard to see how actually you could go to creating quite an advanced dashboard that allows you to do quite a bit of stuff uh, without too much mental overhead. Uh, and also, just as a little example of another thing here, um, Dash comes up with some really great um, debugging tools that you can use. So, for example, down here in this debug mode, if I want to visualize what's happening on my, um, on my web page, I've got this thing called a callback graph. Um, and this will visualize for me in a little debugging tool here the fact that I've got um, my eyesight isn't quite good enough to read this now, but you can see here that I've got um, these three nodes and some relationships between them. Um, and so, when something doesn't work or you're not quite sure what's happening, you have a whole suite of tools down the bottom right hand side of your browser to be able to debug this on the fly. Okay. Cool, so that's our, our first example. Then our second example here, um, displaying a graph I mentioned. So obviously Plotly, um, they have a big uh, plotting library and they're very you know, well known for their, their visualizations. Um, this is actually one line of Python here, I realize, and uh, I've always wanted to do a lightning talk about exactly what you can do in one line of Python sometimes, but um, because it's formatted with black here, hopefully you'll, you'll forgive me. Um, but you can see here we've um, defined uh, another layout, and this time I've literally just got a heading with a graph inside of it, uh, and inside of that graph I've just labeled my, um, you know, my series and my, my, my data and the sort of the annotations for it. Uh, and then I've got this other fantastically uh, convoluted one-line function that I wrote as well, uh, which basically takes a data frame series or a series in, um, in pandas and then will count, uh, return, uh, 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 return two tuples of, uh, no, sorry, return a list of two tuples uh, that tell you the first letter of the alpha, sorry, the letter of the alphabet and then the uh, number of people in this data set that have that, um, that, that have a name, have a first name that begins with that letter. Um, so basically, I'm figuring out how many people are have the, a first name beginning with A, B, C, D, E, F, etc. Uh, and so then uh, you can see that's that part. Uh, and then I've just fed that data into it as well. So now, if we look at what that actually looks like in Dash, you can see here um, that we've got 26. Um, uh, columns here on our histogram, uh, and that apparently the most common letter by the looks of this was J. Is that J or is that I? Has someone got better eyesight? Can they? J. Okay, good stuff. So you don't want to be, you don't want to, well, you don't want to have the name J. Cool. <coughs> so finally, moving on, uh, as I said, the, you can actually also build, rather than just displaying data inside of your, your Dash application, you can actually start to change things in your data as well. And so I call these that transactional tools. And so the classic one here is building a really basic to-do application. Um, so it's like a to-do list where you just put what tasks you have on and so on. Uh, and so here again, I've defined a layout. Uh, and this time I've got uh, my, my heading at the top. I've got an unordered list or a UL there. Uh, it's going to display all of my tasks and it's handled by that list tasks function. Uh, I've got my input as well that's going to take the name of a task and then this button so that when you click the button, it takes whatever's in the input and then adds it to the task list. And then that's going to display, display your new task. Uh, and you can see here that there's this, um, I, I haven't used the database here but for the sake of simplicity, but I've just created a, um, a global variable here that is a dictionary that has a list inside of it. Um, obviously you could replace that with something like MongoDB if you really hated yourself, or you could replace it with like a SQL database if you had some self-esteem. Um, <coughs> uh, Sorry, I'm being unfair in Mongo there, but um, <coughs> yeah, so uh, you can see uh, you've got this function to sort of list our tasks, 
and then we have this callback here to add a task into our um, uh, into our uh, list. Um, and as you can see here, we're going to say basically run this function every single time that um, this button is clicked, um, and then uh, just return a, a return a list of all of these different tasks, and it's going to be put inside of our um, inside of our unordered list on our layout. And so as an example here. Uh, so you could say, if you want to write some tools here, I'll zoom in a bit here so you can see this. Uh, we could do something like give talk room and then set fire to building to evacuate, go to pub. Okay. Uh, and, and now, obviously, because I've stored this in my laptop's uh, sort of global namespace, um, or my sort of global variable here, when I refresh this page, boom, it's still there. And so obviously you could put that in a, in a database, and I've got nothing against Mongo, really. I just don't like it. Um, and yeah, you, know, you, could, you could actually start to change your data set as well as just displaying it. And so I can give you an example of when we've done exactly that, actually, at Decision Lab in a moment. And so obviously you've got this callback here. Finally, as well, you can also build your own Dash components. Um, if you're confident with JavaScript and you want to uh, sort of build something that doesn't exist yet, that's totally cool. You can do it. I would say that the, the Dash API actually inside of JavaScript is slightly limited, and it does limit some of the things you can do, especially with access to um, some more advanced tools like Redux. Um, but again, that's uh, you know, it's a cost benefit, isn't it? Um, the important thing is that you can go very far with Dash. And so, for example, before when I mentioned that project about illegal gold mining in the Amazonian rainforest, um, that was built by two data scientists using Dash. Um, we developed a, a tool here that um, uses uh, human in the loop machine learning. So uh, here we display using this, this map component uh, that we, we built as a wrapper around Leaflet. Um, so here you can see all of the different areas of deforestation that we think might be down to illegal gold mining. Um, and then the users in the Colombian government are actually able to say, is this correct or is it not correct? Now you can see here, this, this isn't the, it's actually a slightly earlier version of it as well. It's not the slickest web application you've ever seen, um, but it wasn't intended to be really. It was built by two uh, you know, data scientists whilst they were also developing a model at the same time and it resulted in a really useful sort of proof of concept and demonstrator for future projects that we can sort of use and build off of that. This wasn't uh, a project that was built by you know, loads of complex software engineering stuff from uh, you know, the putting loads of resource of, of software engineers onto a project. This was all done by data scientists who knew about what they were doing. Um, <coughs> so inevitably, if you start building larger Dash applications, um, the crucial thing here to say there's lots of different tips that I'd, I'd love to talk about more in depth, but do organize your code. Uh, especially things like splitting up your callbacks and your layouts and you know, running your application using a main rather than um, just a random script um, and abstract your kind of logical business stuff or business logic from, from your callbacks as well. So it's like a standard layout that we might use here, but I'll kind of skip over that for the time being. One, one thing at Decision Lab that we are doing at the moment is trying to work towards more of a Dash framework. Um, and so we're running this as a, an open source project that's uh, well, a nascent open source project at the moment. So. Uh, we want to start to take care of things like routing and navigation and provide a really sort of simple set of tools so that if you want to build a larger Dash application, rather than reinventing the wheel all the time, you can use a, an open source project. So if this is something you might be interested in, please do get in touch. Um, but finally, it kind of comes to the, f uh, the point, when should you stop using Dash and start to build, like in inverted quotes, like a proper web application? Well, my kind of answer to that is that Dash is great for two reasons. So you have really rapid UI development by non-specialists. Um, you know, data scientists can build their own tools and go very, very far and very, very fast without too much complex or uh, too much specialist sort of um, development knowledge. And it's really informed development as well, because these data scientists or the people that are building the application know exactly what their problem is and you know, what, how this relates to their client and the user and so on. Um, and they can really fit and uh, build an, an application that fits their analysis. That being said, some of the downsides are that it's really rapid UI development by non-specialists. So you know, if you're going to be building a web application and it's going to go into production eventually, maybe you should start getting some technical uh, you know, front-end developers on board fairly quickly because you're going to need them eventually. You might be creating technical debt. 
um, you, know, you want to start investing time in the front end early on rather than catching up later. And likewise as well, that informed UI development. <laughs> Data scientists are brilliant people, but they're not necessarily UX consultants or designers or you know, people that really, you know, they, they perhaps understand their, their problem, but that's not necessarily the way to build the best application in the world. Um, and so you really start to think, do you need a user researcher? Um, you know, if this is going to be a bigger project, at what point do you start to get you know, user researchers and user ex and UX consultants involved? So finally, Dash is a great tool for facilitating rapid UI development uh, of data-driven interfaces and dashboards. Uh, if you invest a bit of time and effort into it, you can go very, very far, especially if you organize your code um, inside of a Dash application. Um, but eventually, front-end developers are basically going to keep their jobs. So make of that what you will. Thank you. Cool. And yeah, please do get in touch as well. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got time for a few questions. So mm -hmm. you touched upon the topic of when should you stop using Dash and start building uh, a proper website. There's a question related to that. When is it time to stop doing visualization in Jupyter and start doing them in Dash? So. Uh, <laughs> well, I try and, um, as a habit, actually wean people off Jupyter notebooks as quickly as I can. Um, mostly because I find um, it, it, my opinion of GPython notebooks is sometimes that it, it, you, you write lots of Python code and it's saved as a, a JSON object with lots of states and stuff inside of it, and that, that's great. But surely, if, you, if you, know, you, you want to edit it in GPython and run it a little bit, is it that hard to then copy it over into something else or to extract it from there? Um, so I would say sooner rather than later, but I have other data scientist colleagues that I respect very much that absolutely adore GPython notebooks and think that I'm talking nonsense. So it, I think that's a real open-ended question. <laughs> um, I, I would say if, if you want your code to ever be used by people who aren't um, data scientists using GPython notebooks, then start thinking about how you can make your code more accessible, and that often is just in a Unicode file that you can share with people and they can do whatever they want with, I think. So. Second question is... What are some alternatives to Dash? Any good ones? Anything you could you recommend, or is it the uh, end all? Yeah, well, so uh, there are lots of alternatives for, especially if you want to do just visualization. Um, so the classic ones are things like Bokeh and uh, oh god, a new one that I came up with uh, the other day that um, has eluded me. Sorry. Um, <coughs> Damn, no, I, I'll, I'll remember the name and then tweet it or something. Um, but the, I think that the thing that makes Dash sort of stand apart is that ability to do um, transactional stuff. So rather than just displaying your data or you know, creating something that is explicitly a dashboard, if you actually want to create something that's an application that is also a dashboard and could actually go a little bit further than you know, just visualization to actually changing things on your server and providing other functionality, Dash allows you to do that, whereas I'm not aware that or I'm not sure that some things like bokeh and this other thing that I've just has gone out of my head I'm afraid um, necessarily allow you to do in the same way. Cool. Are there any questions from the crowd? So to, to create a Dash component, you have to create a React component. So if you've got a React component that you like, um, then you can wrap that to be able to use it in Dash. Um, but if there's a Dash component that you really like and think, oh, I'd love to use that in my React application, if you go and look on GitHub to find out where the source code of that application is, then it'll be logically separated and you'll be able to find it somewhere. So. Uh, so they're, they're all developed by, uh, so the, the ones out of the box are developed by Plotly. Um, but for example, if you had, uh, if you want to create your own Dash component, um, you could take any old uh, React component and then wrap that in Dash, um, which is what we've done for React Leaflet, um, which uh, I wouldn't say is the most stable thing in the world because React Leaflet and React don't always play very nicely together. But for example, we've, we've done that for Leaflet maps quite recently. So. Cool. Okay. Yeah, so 
uh, deployment at the moment we just do entirely through Docker um, because uh, obviously it makes makes sense. It's very very straightforward. Um, it is sometimes a slight pain, um, especially if you have to deploy on a client machine and it's like, oh, we only use Windows 7 or other things like that, and you have to find alternatives to it. Um, I, I did, uh, got approached by someone very recently, actually, about um, starting a project to simplify some of this um, so that you can literally just, you know, um, maybe run a command that allows you to um, containerize your, your Dash application very quickly and straightforwardly rather than having to play around with your own custom Docker. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, maybe drop me a line or something and can, we can talk about it. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm also quite keen to figure out if I could make Dash serverless, um, but uh, that's probably my Christmas project, so um, I'm not big now. Yeah. Cool, thank you very much. Uh, uh, oh, oh, right, <laughs> Um, no, so am I, um, uh, well, so one of the reasons why I'm, I know mostly about Dash actually is because our sort of data science team said, oh, this is like the best solution for us at the moment. Um, uh, I, people have mentioned Holiday's to me, I've seen some things from it. Um, I, I, I don't know enough to be able to give a kind of a coherent answer on that, I'm afraid. So, yeah. Uh, is there, oh, sorry. Uh, what was that, sorry? Uh, no, not yet. So I've heard a lot of people say uh, good good things about Julia, um, and uh, it, it's one of those languages that seems to have like a very very enthusiastic cult following. Um, and at the moment, I'm in the Rust camp in that kind of following, but I haven't I haven't joined the Julia camp yet. Um, it's certainly something that I'd love to um, to explore in the future, but um, I, I can't say I've used it. I'm afraid. So. Cool. cool. That's all. Uh, thank you uh, very much for coming. Uh, Dom will stick around for for a few. Minutes, yeah, minutes, definitely. Like yeah. Uh, we're we're going to have you back in about 15 or 20 minutes, but until then, feel free to finish up uh, all the drinks and everything. And if you've got any questions for any of us, then feel free to approach us. We're going to organize our next meetup probably sometime early next year. Uh, if you, again, if you've got any suggestions for topics, anything that you'd be interested in, anything you want to present, or know about someone who wants to present, then please do tell us. We always i uh, love to hear more about topics that we don't know much about, like Dash or the automotive industry. So thank you very much, and uh, have a good evening. Thank you for having me. Great. Cheers. <laughs>